All right, good afternoon and welcome to Wandell and Associates webinar Wednesday. I'm Tim Ellis, Wealth Strategist and Senior Investment Strategist here at WNA. Uh, also doubling as today's host for the topic, Don't Stop Believing Journey Through a Pandemic. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through the, uh, the path of the coronavirus and COVID-19 pandemic uh, from an economic standpoint, market standpoint, uh, up until the latest data we have, a lot of it is through last week. So hopefully it's a little bit more current uh, than what you're seeing. Uh, the title, Don't Stop Believing, uh, we try to be positive about it. It, it looks like, um, you know, through the shutdown, we've probably seen some bottoming here, and you'll see in the data that I'll show you, and gradually started a little bit of an uptrend uh, here in the last few weeks as economies have started to reopen, states have started to re reopen, municipalities uh, still got capacity constraints, not everybody's back to work, uh, but uh, a little bit more positive than at least for the last two months. Uh, also a play on, um, you know, maybe the greatest karaoke late night band in the last 35 years. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to sing for you today. Uh, I don't want to see anybody run out of this meeting. Um, okay, um, also you'll have an option here at the end, but I wanted to give it to you uh, now. You can text PANDEMIC, uh, P-A-N-D-E-M-I-C, to 44222 if you're not on our weekly email list. Uh, that'll get you signed up for it. Dale Waddell and I write the uh, weekly strategic insight uh, every week, uh, every Sunday morning now. Uh, you get it in your email inbox, a market uh, economic uh, kind of update, uh, just kind of topic of the day, uh, top of mind questions. And uh, please sign up for our weekly email if you haven't already. If you have a question uh, at the end of this or even throughout it, uh, there should be a Q&A box. Uh, please just click in there, drop me a question. I'll try to answer a couple at the end of this, uh, assuming I don't run long. I don't want to keep you too long. We'll try to keep it to 30 minutes here. Um, you know, no, no promises. I've, I've got a few slides to get through, but uh, hopefully good content for you here today. And with that said, let's try to get us started here. Uh, a quick disclaimer for you. And uh, today's agenda, try to keep it to five big topics. Um, all very relevant uh, financial world. Consumer spending, we are a almost 70%, I think it's right at 68% of US economy. And today it will be a little bit more US based. We do have global portfolios here, but uh, US, it's easier to get the data. Our portfolios are, are very heavily weighted towards US. So I, I think that's probably, uh, you know, uh, the right region to spend it in on this. Uh, everybody's been a little bit different throughout this pandemic. Uh, so U.S. consumer spending, uh, U.S. economy 68% plus uh, consumption. So that's kind of a good area to spend it on. Employment is going to go hand in hand with uh, spending. Uh, stimulus, a uh, big part of, uh, of, of the positive market reaction in the last two months. Uh, the overall economy, what we've got so far, and, and maybe some uh, uh, some newer high frequency data to measure, uh, and then just what's going on in the markets, uh, which uh, most of you are, are, are well aware of. Uh, with all the volatility we've had, what's going on recently, but I just want to revisit not only the big indices, but, um, you know, by the different uh, kind of sectors, uh, commodities, everything, kind of take a look at what's happened since the bottom, where we're at today. Uh, I couldn't fit everything in here. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, there could have been a healthcare uh, kind of topic. You probably don't want me being your armchair epidemiologist, but it does factor into what's going on in the market. We've seen it with, uh, you know, vaccines and antivirals, uh, news that have moved the markets the last two or three weeks. Um, but uh, I'll weave it into some of this, but it's not a standalone topic. Same thing with uh, some of the more cyclical items like housing which was a huge part of 2007, 2009 crisis. Um, this is a little bit different. Uh, if you look at residential housing, it's prices have held up pretty well, but inventories are down 20%, so that probably helps. Uh, commercial real estate, 
Uh, it'll be interesting to see how uh, you know prices hold up with um, you know telework, telehealth, more people working from home, um, kind of long-term retail mixed use, all of this space, what that environment looks like, uh, uh, auto sales, and other, those other cyclical names. Uh, we're not going to cover in depth today, but I'll, I'll try to hit them in a weekly email or we'll do another one of these webinars down the road to address that. Uh, before we get into the first line item, just a quick refresher on the timeline uh, of this pandemic. Uh, so December 31st, New Year's Eve, China reports a cluster of new pneumonia cases coming out of Wuhan. One week later, it's confirmed that that pneumonia is actually a novel coronavirus. Uh, COVID-19, and, um, you know, this is, SARS was 2002, 2003, uh, you know, really first, well, uh, there was MERS in there between, uh, but first widespread uh, coronavirus since then. Uh, 111, uh, first, first death in China. January 20th, that was the first confirmed uh, U.S. case, Washington State. Uh, a guy had been visiting China, uh, uh, family in Wuhan, China. I believe he got back on the 15th. He uh, went to urgent care center, got tested. And uh, interestingly, I read an article in the last couple of days. Uh, this may not be patient zero because there's another cluster in British Columbia and, and probably some more people that came over as well. But by the end of February, you had community spread uh, in Washington state. Uh, so not necessarily patient zero, but first confirmed U.S. case. Other countries were also reporting uh, COVID-19 cases by then. End of January uh, 131, we've got an executive order blocking uh, travel from uh, China to the U.S. Uh, February 28th, first uh, COVID-19 death in the U.S. Most of it was, um, I can't remember the first case, but uh, the first concentration in the retirement community uh, in Washington State. Uh, this end of February, yeah, you had a few hot spots popping up by then. Uh, March 11th, we've got a uh, ban on Europe travel. Uh, March 13th, we've got a uh, national emergency declaration. March 15th, CDC recommends no gatherings for 50 or more people. Within a couple of days, it was 10 or more people. Uh, at that point, uh, you know, we were canceling. Uh, the sports seasons, you had a few popular people out there that have been diagnosed, and uh, it's in the public consciousness by, by then. Uh, here locally, I believe our mayor um, did a, uh, a stay-at-home order on March 23rd, the governor a little bit later, April 3rd, I believe. So just timeline, and I'll, I'll kind of weave in, I've got a chart at the end uh, about how the market reacted to kind of each of these data points. All right, first big topic, consumer spending. You may have seen some news stories about this a couple of weeks ago just because the number was so historically bad. And we've had a few of those news stories coming out of this. I'll get employment to the next section, really bad numbers. Uh, this is retail spending from March to April, drop of 16.4%. And uh, pretty bad across the board. What, what's held up really has been e-commerce, uh, some home improvement. Um, we were just talking about this as a group uh, yesterday. As you're kind of stuck around the house, I think more people have noticed things that need to be fixed. Uh, the big box stores like Home Depot and Lowe's have, have done pretty well. Uh, other than that, you've got a lot of your more discretionary names that could be put on hold have been put on hold. Clothing accessories are now 79%. Um, you know, you take uh, food service drink places uh, down 30% plus. This is just April and March. I mean, March to April. Uh, March was a big drop as well. That was 8% drop. So you've had back to back, month over month, record breaking drops in retail spending as everything has been shut down. And uh, we're doing month to month, but year over year is about 18% drop as well. Um, it really should be expected as you've had everything shut down. Uh, really there at the end of March. So for the whole month of April, uh, you had people sheltering in place and a big drop off in retail spending. Okay, this is, so these numbers, retail spending, that's from the U.S. Census Bureau. We wanted a little bit more up to, up to spending numbers. 
And so this data is from company uh, Tintin Data, and uh, they pull spending from five million different credit card users. Um, uh, there's a few more that, that have very similar studies. JP Morgan does their own out of their Chase uh, cards, and uh, they're, they're all trending fairly similar. Uh, five million, it should be a, a fairly representative sample here. And we've got a few, the lines are just a few of these timelines in here. Uh, the first bar, first reported U.S. case. Second bar is a uh, uh, public health emergency declared, I believe that's the WHO. Uh, third is the first reported U.S. death. And fourth is this uh, March 11th travel ban uh, for Europe. And that was really kind of the breaking point right there. Um, this is combined spending kind of across all of those categories for credit card users. At the low point, March 28th, spending was down 46%. Uh, since then, we've rallied a little bit. So as of May 18th, we we're still down 25% year over year, uh, but a market improvement uh, where we were at the low point in March. Um, I, I pulled a little bit. Uh, more recent data, it was only uh, one more day recent, it had ticked up to 23.3%. Uh, you'll gradually see some improvement there as we kind of reopen. Uh, the, these are the big things to watch. Uh, and it, it kind of lends itself to our next topic as well as employment, uh, but how people are spending. We also went through and looked at it by category. So this, I'll start with the worst, uh, which is travel. Airlines, these are all year over year. Airlines down 97%, uh, car rentals 85%, crews down 130. How are you down more than 100%? Well, you know, you, you've issued refunds. Uh, there's nobody going on cruises. The, uh, probably the first big public item was this uh, Diamond Princess cruise ship. That was February 4th. Uh, a lot of, uh, for a lot of people that's the first time uh, they kind of heard of COVID-19 after it got quarantined off the coast with a ton of people infected. Uh, cruise ships held up for a little while after that. You can see, um, you know, uh, kind of holding steady until we get to March and just fell off a cliff. And nobody's been on a cruise ship since, uh, it seems like. Uh, hotels down 87% year over year. Uh, hotel occupancy uh, they do report that fairly often, so that's another thing to look out for. It's not going to be completely representative because you've got a lot of business travel that's been put on hold. Uh, you know, companies just don't want to uh, send their people back on the road yet for liability reasons. And if they can do Zoom or other of these meeting technologies, they're going to do that right now. Uh, so hotels, maybe not the best item to watch uh, as we kind of reopen, uh, but still very low. Restaurants. If you look at the subcategories, we get fast food, fast casual, casual dining, fine dining, um, all down significantly. Uh, fast food held up the best at down 19%, fine dining the worst at down 83%. You've held up better uh, as you've been able to adapt to kind of pick up in curbside. Um, fine dining, uh, I guess the second aspect of this is, uh, you know, kind of the actual dollar spent on food. If uh, your income is in flux, uh, you're probably not going to spend that much uh, on, um, you know, kind of outside of groceries, you know, your, your uh, discretionary food spending. And that's what we've kind of seen across the board. So fast food and fast casual have held up okay. Uh, still down pretty big, but casual dining and fine dining um, still down significantly. Uh, that's through May 11th, uh, fine dining uh, down 83%. Another uh, data item that you can watch is the open table reservations. You can get that data. And um, hopefully, uh, I would imagine there's some pent up demand out there as people are sick of cooking at the house um, and uh, eventually will wander back out to restaurants um, as we get kind of uh, better numbers on case counts. Uh, as they feel a little bit more comfortable. Uh, we, we've already seen a little bit of probably over Memorial Weekend, uh, some anecdotal evidence of, of people out and about. Okay, uh, general commerce, um, probably the best of the group. Um, 
you see a big spike in mid-March, and this is kind of the stockpiling effects. Um, it seems like we're just now getting toilet paper and this infected wise back in stores. There was a big run on some of these cleaning and necessary items all the way up to, you know, the meats for grocery stores. Uh, so grocery stores have had a big year. Uh, people are seeing home cooking, sheltering place, and that you've also got that stockpiling aspect. So year over year, groceries are up 5%. Uh, the big box stores, Walmart, uh, Target, uh, only down 7% on the year. Pharmacies are down 22%. You've had a lot of your, um, you know, elective procedures, elective surgeries deferred. Uh, drug costs are probably down. People are staying out of uh, doctor's offices as best they can throughout the shutdown. So pharmacy actually is down 22%. The wholesale club, Sam's Club, Costco, uh, holding it flat on the year. Okay, retail and uh, just did three subcategories on this one. Um, apparel still down 50%. Uh, I, I showed you the uh, Census Bureau data and this lines up pretty well where at one point apparel was down more than 75%. It has rallied back. People are eventually going to close again. Uh, they just kind of feel good about their discretionary spending, their employment income, disposable income but it's still down from credit card data, about 50%. Uh, office supplies and pet supplies uh, had that same kind of stockpiling feature that we saw for groceries and some of the big box and general merchandise stores uh, where there was a spike in mid-March and now they've kind of flattened out and are slightly negative uh, year over year. So that was the actual spending data. Um, if we look at the sentiment readings, and the best one out there, there's two different ones that we look at, uh, University of Michigan and then the conference board. Uh, this is University of Michigan, the index of consumer sentiment. And we've had a big downturn, there, there's no doubt about it, um, on uh, consumer sentiment. But if you look at this very bottom of the curve, and the dotted line is the monthly data, the solid line, they do a three month kind of smooth average. But if you look at the dotted line, you do see there has been an improvement month over month, and it's not a big improvement, but hopefully we get some bottoming there on the sentiment readings and kind of um, and get some momentum out of this. What's interesting is that this, this chart goes back 10 years, but uh, the consumer sentiment never got as low as we did in 2011. Uh, 2011, uh, you also had a market downturn, about a 20% downturn in there uh, we had a government shutdown. We had the Eurozone debt crisis. Uh, we were only a couple of years past the, uh, the great financial crisis. Uh, so people were still a little bit jittery. And uh, you had a, a, a low of uh, less than 60 on the index at that point. We didn't get down that low this time. We only got down to about 71 on the sentiment reading. And it looks like we've had very slight improvement. Uh, the expectations that improves again for the next reading so hopefully we've got some bottom activity on the sentiment levels, which uh, should bode well for future spending. Uh, this just goes back further. Uh, last chart was 10 years. This goes back all the way to 1960. Uh, you can see 2008, 2009 was below 60, very similar to 2011. Uh, early 80s recessions had very low depths on it. Uh, this is more similar to kind of late 80s. Uh, 2000, 2002 kind of debt bubble uh, bursting, uh, uh, debt bubble bursting. Uh, that's kind of the, the sentiment levels we're at now. All right, employment, uh, and this is going to go hand in hand with spending. As people are still gainfully employed, they're going to spend their discretionary income. And this has been, um, you know, uh, not pick on the media, but they, they do love uh, some some big negative numbers, and uh, this has been the scariest of all of them. Uh, Thirty eight million people uh, filing unemployment claims since March. Um, it it is bad. It's it's off the chart bad. Um, the the only uh, two kind of positives that you can glean from it. Uh, one. These employment numbers have been, have been trending down. So uh, 6.9 million, uh, yeah, 6.9 million was the top 
end of this uh, claim at the end of March has gradually been trending down to about 2 million at the latest reading. Uh, the other thing, uh, a mission of the weekly email uh, two weeks ago, of those uh, unemployment claims uh, in, the, in the jobs report uh, that just came out for April, uh, about 78% of those people surveyed uh, reported that they've been furloughed, uh, which is, is a sign of a, a temporary layoff instead of a permanent layoff. And those are probably the only two positives to glean from it. Um, you know, unemployment benefits did get addressed in the CARES Act. You know, so they're, they're getting additional federal unemployment benefits, uh, but they're still, it's probably still not gonna trickle into spending uh, until those people are gainfully employed and feel good about their income prospects. This goes into a little bit more detail on those employment claims since March. Um, you know, uh, first spike uh, was March 21st, week ending 3.3 million. We went all the way up to 6.9 million. It had been gradually trending down ever since. Uh, last reading, uh, week, uh, week ending May 16 was 2.4 million of initial unemployment claims. That uh, if, if you look at the April um, uh, number that just came out, um, you know, uh, the unemployment rate, the headline number spiked all the way to almost 15%. Uh, we were at 3.5%. Historic lows to just off the chart highs uh, as the economy shut down and we, we saw mass layoffs, mass furloughs as, as people adjust to the shutdown period. So if we look forward, um, where does unemployment go from here? The Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, uh, don't call them San Fran, um, has a few different projections on where unemployment goes from here. We've already seen it spike to 15%. So they lay out a few different scenarios. Uh, I'll start with the worst, historical outflow dynamics. And that's just the fancy phrase for if this period follows past recovery periods. So if you have a typical recovery uh, from this recession, from this spike in unemployment, that's what it looks like. And it is a very gradual, uh, typically, uh, you know, uh, past recessions, you had the elevator down, uh, big unemployment numbers, um, and then kind of stair step it back up. Not to the elevator down that we've had here, uh, but uh, that's just kind of the, the typical uh, higher back is, is a much slower period. So you can see kind of uh, two years from now, we're still barely getting uh, to 10% unemployment rate. Uh, the next one is lower participation, and this just looks at labor uh, participation rates. Typically in one of these downturns, you have some people that have been laid off that just never get back into the workforce. So you can, uh, what it does to the data is the spike never gets as high as this possible 20 to 25%. It stays around 15% where those people just say that they're not looking for work any longer. Uh, so you, you've got a lower unemployment rate headline number, but you've also got a lower participation rate and, and then gradually comes back down. And uh, on the, on the way back down, this is also kind of just normal recovery patterns. What we think is probably more likely, and um, uh, it's, it's probably gonna be a little bit of a combination, but I'll just talk you through it. Um, the hiring bounce, because of the nature of this crisis, because of the huge unemployment claims uh, here, just in a short amount of time, you probably do get a big bounce back in hiring uh, as soon as economies and shops start to reopen. Uh, a good chunk of this is people, pay, uh, people facing business, restaurants and bars, uh, doctor offices that had elective procedures. Um, as soon as they reopen, there's gonna be some uh, people that are hired back and then you gradually recover from there. So uh, call it uh, two years from now, you're, uh, you're more than back to normal. In fact, about a year and a half from now, you're, you're, you're back to where you were at less than 5% unemployment. The, the next scenario, GDP hiring forecast, is unemployment kind of follows your GDP. And I'll, I'll get to GDP in a second, but we're gonna have a large uh, downturn in GDP for the second quarter. 
but expected recoveries in third quarter and fourth quarter, uh, and then higher than normal for the next couple of years as we gradually recover. Uh, same thing, uh, so what if unemployment follows GDP? And uh, you can kind of see, um, you know, kind of year and a half, we're, we're, we're back to close to 5%. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of a good scenario. It, it did get uh, back to that 3.5% that we're at, but that was already a 50-year low. Uh, this is probably um, kind of reality, which uh, uh, before now, everybody thought 5% unemployment rate was probably good. Anything lower than you had inflation and wages. We didn't quite get that, but uh, that was kind of the conventional thinking. If, if you look at us, we probably think it's a combination of these three. Uh, a lot of this hiring balance, I do think as soon as the economy's reopened, you, you are gonna have a lot of people that were furloughed come back to the workforce. Uh, some people are gonna uh, you know, take this opportunity and uh, just kind of do a semi or early retirement. So participation may fall a little bit. You, you've already seen it tick down some. Um, and, and the GDP, it's going to kind of go hand in hand with hiring balance. Uh, so those two are, are very similar. So I think it's going to be a combination of those three going forward uh, for unemployment, uh, which should, should bode well for the economy and spending as well. Okay, uh, stimulus. Uh, David and I both covered this pretty well. This is actually from one of David's charts uh, that he did about a month ago. Probably the most important factor and the balance that we've gotten so far is the level of stimulus and how fast we got it. Um, this chart covers what the Fed has done uh, on the monetary side. And so they immediately, almost immediately cut interest rates to zero. There was actually two different cuts. Um, one was a half a percent. That was, uh, I believe, on March 3rd. Well, I've got the timeline here. Um, so yeah, March 3rd, you had a, uh, here it is. Uh, yeah, 50% cut, and then on March 15th, I believe. Yeah, March 15th, you had 1% cut. So uh, interest rates weren't that high to begin with, and we immediately cut back to zero. First time we've done that since 2008, 2009. The other aspect is the size of the Fed's balance sheet and quantitative easing. And uh, you can actually see um, a huge run up from 2008, 2009 crisis. We were buying bonds all the way into uh, 2015. We had leveled it off. We were just keeping the size of the balance sheet level. And finally, we had gotten to the point, I uh, say we, the Federal Reserve had gotten to the point where they thought that maybe they could let the size of this balance sheet run off and normalize. Well, we didn't get far into that before we had a couple of downturns. And uh, here we are with another big downturn. And so we had already started doing some quantitative easing and buying treasury bonds last year. This took this to another level where we, uh, latest data as of last week, we're up to over seven trillion. And it's not only treasury bonds, uh, this is mortgage backs, agencies, um, you know, they're doing corporate bonds now. So this is a quantitative easing with no end date and a lot of room to buy bonds. And so that's, that's the monetary stimulus. Very important, the amount of liquidity that the Fed provided because the, um, the bond market almost froze up uh, during that period. Uh, we got to a point where there was a massive run on cash, not only from retail investors, but from, uh, from businesses. And uh, since the end of February, there's been $2.4 trillion of cash raised to try to weather this downturn. Where did people go for cash? They went to the things that held up best, they went to their bonds, and you just didn't have a liquid market for a while until the Fed stepped in. And uh, Warren Buffett talked about it uh, in his shareholder meeting, but um, a lot of these corporations should be sending thank you notes to the Fed for what they've done and for the bond market. And for, for bond investors who had seen their principal values come down, uh, corporate bonds that have recovered um, you know, most of their values since then, High yield is still down a little bit, uh, but they have made progress. This is the timeline of the Fed's actions uh, with the S&P, the blue lines of the S&P. So we were at record highs at the end of February. As we started experiencing uh, some of this pandemic, you get a 50 basis point cut, uh, half, half percent cut, full percent cut, we're at zero. 
On uh, March 23rd, the Fed announced that they were uh, restarting quantitative easing. That is the market low point. Uh, so we got a bounce off of that. And on April 8th or 9th, uh, the day before Good Friday, uh, they expanded that bond buying program to the corporate bonds and they kind of laid out the path from the CARES Act um, that they could leverage their money up. They got $450 billion on the CARES Act. They could lever that up 10 to 1 to get $4 trillion worth of funding. And uh, the market's taken off even more after that. All right, the fiscal side, uh, CARES Act, um, that there were a, a couple other things in there before that. Um, you know, kind of, uh, expansions of uh, unemployment, uh, free testing for coronavirus, um, and then just uh, national emergency declaration. But uh, the big thing was CARES Act of 2.2 trillion. Um, and the numbers uh, are, are sort of not perfectly, but um, the funding anywhere from 2.2 to 2.4 trillion total, it's not going to be much consolation for those that are worried about the deficit. Um, but not all of that 2.4 trillion is caused. Some of these are federally guaranteed loans that will be paid back. That's about 500 billion of this. It's still going to cost taxpayers 1.8, 1.9 trillion over time. Uh, or at least added to the deficit. At $2.4 trillion, uh, this fiscal stimulus was almost 12% of our GDP. So a massive, massive stimulus. Uh, and there's been talked about even more on top of this, uh, especially if we don't get the economy reopened by, uh, you know, call it uh, June, July. You know, th there might be more fiscal stimulus on top of this. So if you look at the breakdown, uh, recovery uh, uh, rebate recovery checks, $1,200 for each adult, $500 for each child, as long as you were under 150,000 income, if you were married, uh, it, it started phasing out at, at that point. They, they boosted unemployment benefits. You get an additional $600 per week from the uh, federal government in addition to whatever you get from state. So I think in Tennessee, it's $875 per week unemployment benefits uh, through July 31st. Um, We've got uh, airlines and a few other essential businesses got bailouts. Um, we got one, a loan program, including uh, 360, I believe it's 360 billion in change for this payroll protection program. Those are forgivable loans to small businesses. Um, uh, the rest of it should be paid back. Uh, you have support for municipalities um, and uh, hospitals, healthcare, and, and just a, a few other items that tally up to 500 million plus. Okay, uh, economy, and I just looked at it from a GDP perspective. First quarters came in and you had one month of the downturn, uh, down 4.8% in that one month. Second quarter is gonna be really painful. Uh, so this is Morgan Stanley who we've used in the past. Um, yeah, a little bit dated, but uh, not much has really changed since this first estimate came out. Um, so you can see that first number came at 4.8. Second quarter is projected at down 38%. But then uh, projected recoveries in third quarter and fourth quarter in 2021. So you can see positive growth rates expected starting in third quarter, including a pretty big bounce back. Um, it's really dependent on how fast we get reopened, what kind of bounce we get. Uh, but that's GDP projections, the best we've got now. Uh, this, the, the Federal Reserve Bank in Atlanta does a GDP Now website where they uh, try to do a real-time estimate of the next quarter. So this is uh, second quarter estimates are kind of ranging from down 30 to down 45. Uh, and bank of GDP is actually um, yeah, one of the more pessimistic um, kind of indicators down 42% per second quarter. So it's going to draw a lot of negative headlines, and it should. Um, but uh, we're going to have a, a, a large economic output drop for this next quarter, hopefully recovery after that. i say hopefully, because if, if we look at some of this high-frequency data that we're getting, and I just pulled, uh, Goldman had a few of them, uh, credit card spending, uh, which we've already looked at some, that 1010 10 data, uh, four squares, kind of a check-in software, uh, all consumer spending, and then uh, mobility index that tracks retail transit. 
uh, and, and work, mobility. All those have, have kind of bottomed in April and are on a little bit of the uptick. Uh, we looked at a few more uh, mortgage applications have been out five weeks in a row. Uh, gasoline has been out the last few weeks. Uh, so we're seeing some of this high frequency data that we can get on a weekly and daily basis. And all of those are trending up a little bit in the past few weeks. Okay, and I'll end on market update. Um, this is a very busy chart, uh, but it takes some of these uh, kind of big news stories and weaves them into what the market's done. So if you look at the blue chart, uh, uh, excuse me, the blue line uh, and, and, and this axis, this is the Dow Jones Industrial uh, Average. Uh, the peak was almost at 30,000, 29,000, 551. Uh, this is kind of mid-February and it, it held, held steady uh, really through kind of the third week in February. Even as we were getting some of the data out of China, we were still holding up better. The orange line, uh, gold line, is U.S. Treasury yields. This is the 10-year Treasury note. Um, in addition to the stock market, you know, Treasury yields, interest rates have fallen off the map. And so this just gives you two look, both at kind of a uh, bond aspect and a stock aspect. Um, we were, uh, again, uh, holding pretty steady, even as the death toll in China surpassed uh, kind of the SARS outbreak in mid-February. Uh, really, when it jumped to uh, a couple other countries, South Korea, Italy was the first major one um, uh, where the uh, Iran had, uh, had had some issues, but uh, they, Italy just had a, a trouble getting it under control. And at that point, um, you know, uh, the stock market really started dropping and, and uh, really picked up steam around, uh, you know, the, the first announcements. Uh, from uh, WHO that this is a pandemic, and then um, we had uh, declared a national disaster. At that point, uh, this takes us almost all the way to the bottom on March 23rd. So what have we done since then? Um, the first column is since that market bottom on March 23rd. Second column is year to date. And this looks at major stock indexes, uh, different styles, growth value, um, uh, currencies, sectors, and I'll just walk through um, a couple of important ones that we're looking at. Um, one, the, the things that have held up the best have been sectors and indexes that aren't people facing. Um, so uh, technology, consumer services have held up well. Consumer, uh, consumer staples have held up well as, as people have, they tend to be more defensive and, and people have to have, you know, their, their toilet paper, their disinfectant wipes, and Clorox and Walmart, uh, and some of those major providers have held up fine throughout this downturn. What we're looking at going forward, um, and it's really kind of a proxy for Main Street um, and, and just smaller business, is the uh, S&P small cap 600 and S&P mid cap 400. So those are still down 17 and 24%. They both had good bounces off the bottom, but they, uh, they fell much further. So they've got a longer way to run. Uh, the, uh, you know, some of the S&P is, is, uh, is definitely top, top heavy from these technology names uh, like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, um, and so uh, we've seen some rotation in the past few days. I think it continued again today. I haven't checked in the past few hours, but um, uh, some of the technologies that have done well, Netflix, Zoom, um, uh, Amazon, uh, were all negative today and small value did really well. That's been a trend over the last three days. That kind of rebalancing um, is, should continue as economies uh, uh, reopen and uh, we kind of get reintegrated out there. Uh, that's what we're looking for from an asset class and kind of style perspective going forward is uh, some of these smaller names to, to recovery, uh, to recover and uh, stock prices to recover along with it. Uh, same thing for oil, uh, still down 75% year to date, uh, down 35% from the bottom. 
uh, a really tough commodity as there has been to be as people haven't been traveling. Uh, same thing for global demand. Um, and uh, commodities as a whole has struggled throughout this thing. Uh, I don't have bonds on here, uh, but the high yield index is still down uh, five to six percent. Asset backed securities are down. Uh, securitized bonds are still down. Investment grade, investment grade corporates, uh, your ag index, which includes a lot of treasuries, are positive on the year. Uh, but we expect those more credit sensitive names that perform worse to continue to recover like they have been for the past month and a half. Um, and uh, so that's where we're looking uh, kind of in fixed income world. Um, with that said, let me check to see if we've got any questions that came through. All right, so just a couple. Um, one uh, deficit related question, um, you know, should we be worried about the deficit? Yes and no. Um, we don't necessarily prescribe to the modern monetary theory where, um, you know, we can just print money to come out of it. Uh, but with interest rates where they are, and the 10 year is below 0.7%, uh, the 30 year is only at uh, less than 1.5%. It is a low carry cost to, to finance some of this recovery. And uh, kind of the stark fact is, um, you know, we're, we're just going to have to do it to climb out of this mess. Um, so it is a concern. The, the other thing we look at is Japan, uh, which has had, had a higher debt to GDP ratio than we have, and they still have rock bottom interest rates. So until we get to some type of tipping point where interest rates and inflation start skyrocketing, um, you know, things should probably stay status quo as far as uh, our, our debt level and deficit levels. Um, I think I've probably kept you long enough. Uh, we're at 45 minutes here. Uh, I wish I had some journey to end you with, but I did not bring um, any music with me in here. Um, I apologize for the quarantine look. I've not had a haircut in 12 weeks. I grew out a beard to go along with it. Um, so please don't think I'm a fugitive on the run. Uh, I am in Waddell and Associates Conference Room. I look forward to seeing you uh, hopefully here soon. If not, uh, I'll get you on the phone or we'll do a Zoom call. Uh, again, if you aren't signed up for our weekly email, uh, please text PANDEMIC to 44222. We'll make sure you get signed up. If you have any, um, any questions related to the presentation, I can, I can try to get you a copy of the slides or any, answer any questions that you may not want to ask today. Uh, just shoot me an email, tim at lindellonassociates.com, I'll spell it out, or you can give me a call, uh, direct lines 901-586-2067. And I uh, really appreciate everyone for attending today. Thank you all.